Welcome to the Open to Hope Show. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley with my daughter and co-host. Dr. Heidi Horsley. This show is brought to you by the Open to Hope Foundation in partnership with the Compassionate Friends and the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation. Well, Heidi, we've got a great guest on today. We're mm -hmm. going to be talking about trauma treatments. And we've got a wonderful expert mm -hmm. on the show. Um, we've got uh, Dave Bessel. We've got, doc we've got two doctors. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Go for so it. we've got Dr. Bessel Vander Koch, and we've got Dr. David Fagenbaum. And Dr. Bessel, Dr. Bessel Vander Koch is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Boston University Medical School. He is the founder and medical director of the Trauma Center in Brookline, Massachusetts, and he is the author of a groundbreaking New York Times best-selling book, The Body Keeps the Score. Brain, Mind, and Body in the Healing of Trauma. And then we have Dr. David Fagenbaum. David's mother died when he was in college at Georgetown where he was the quarterback of the football team. I love saying that. <laughs> <laughs> David is a friend of mine. Uh, he is also the founder and board chair of the National Students of AMF Support Network. He has an MBA and he is a medical doctor. And so we are gonna start with Bessel, welcome to the show. Hi. It's great having you on, Bessel, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the treatments of trauma, but talk about how the body keeps score. What did you mean by that when you wrote the book? Well, trauma is about experiencing something that is too horrendous for words. Mm -hmm. It just overwhelms the human organism, basically. And so it is horrific, and you don't want to talk about it, and you don't want to go there, and you really would like to push it away but your body keeps reliving it and playing it. Mm -hmm. So you have these heartbreaking and gut-wrenching sensations and you collapse and you are agitated and so your body is in the state of hyper-arousal and collapse and somehow you need to quiet yourself down to learn to know what you know and feel what you feel and to actually confront what happened. But well, you can I only confront yourself if it with these issues if, if it's safe for you to go there. So mm -hmm. the establishment of safety, and it has many, many layers, is the critical issue. Yeah. You know, um, talking about the trauma, I'll have to say when I was reading your book, yeah. The Body Kept, uh, Keeps Score, I had to remember back to when my son was killed in an automobile yeah. accident. He and his cousin were burned to death. Mm -hmm. And they told us that we could not, we would not be able to see the body. And I happened to have been teaching at the University of Rochester in the yeah. area of grief and loss, and I felt that we should see the body, so we called the mortician, and I haven't even told this story, and we had, I said, is there anything we can see? And he said, well, his foot. Mm -hmm. And so we had his whole body wrapped in gauze, and his cousin too, and they were very constricted, if you've seen somebody who's been burned, and we saw their foot. Well, my daughter, Heidi's younger sister, we all went in to see the body. I had a friend who was a psychiatric nurse with me who I don't even know if I would have dared to to have done it without her. Right. We went in to see his body together, and my younger daughter was standing there with Heidi's sister, and my 14-year-old daughter said, I knew it wasn't him. Mm -hmm. She's 14. And my, uh, her sister, who was uh, 19 at the time, said, feel his foot, it has calluses on it. Mm -hmm. And you know he played sports, and you know it's him. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was trauma of yeah. seeing that and replaying it, I drew it. Um, right. For year, uh, probably a year after, right. I would draw a picture of him in the coffin. Right. You would? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, wow. so, so I impressive. would doodle it. See, what's impressive to me is that you now, many years later, are able to remember the precise details of mm -hmm. it. Yeah. That means that something in you has allowed it for you to become safe enough to know that that happened back then. Mm -hmm. Right. That's and I bet you didn't get that very, very easily because no. the first time you go there, you are freaked out, you're overwhelmed, mm -hmm. and you try not to go there. So it takes a lot of courage, actually, mm -hmm. to say it is the callus of his foot. Mm -hmm. So it's those details that exactly. you need to go to, to to really resolve it and say, yes, it happened. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember yeah. seeing the body? Yeah. What was your Absolutely. Yeah. And I remember that it was important for me because I didn't believe it was real. And it made it, it kind of made it me realize that he actually was gone. Um, but what happened with me is that I relived the accident. Even though I wasn't there, I yeah. knew what had happened. Yep. And I relived it over and over for 
a very long time, and, yeah. and especially in my dreams, I would have nightmares constantly. Yeah. I was trapped in the story of how he died, right. and I didn't know how to get out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what we oftentimes use for that is EMDR, mm. the eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. At first glance, it sounds like a crazy technique. Mm -hmm. You ask people to evoke the images, the thoughts, the, what you heard, what you were thinking. You don't necessarily talk because it's about your learning to integrate the memory and put the fragments together into the past. And then you ask people to follow your eyes, uh, uh, follow your hands with their eyes, mm -hmm. and you move the eyes back and forth. And we're actually doing a piece of research right now to see precisely what happens in the brains as the eye moves back and forth, and we should have some results in that in, in a few months from now. Um, but somehow, similarly to dreams, um, the images, the pieces, people have these nightmares, mm -hmm. they have the nightmares in part because they can't put it together. Oh, okay. And it keeps coming up. So the, the, what you do in ordinary dreaming after every day, the dreams sort of put the daytime stuff together and we have all had the experience of going to bed and feeling terrible mm -hmm. and upset and wanting to quit our job, etc. Mm -hmm. And you wake up the next morning, wake up, okay, just yeah. another day. Yeah. So it's something self-healing about dreaming. Mm -hmm. I think EMDR is just one mechanism that really allows that natural healing mechanism of the body to come to life. Um, we did some NIH-funded study on that, and it had exceptionally good results, you know, because it's such a silly technique. People sort of say, oh, yeah, right. let's do more cognitive treatment. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it had much better results than cognitive treatment right. because people can really help the memory to go like, that's not terrible. And to have compassion for themselves for having had that experience, but to also see, get a sense of perspective of, yes, it really happened. Mm -hmm. But it happened like the way you talked about your son. It's happened back in Rochester mm -hmm. so many years ago. Mm -hmm. And to really get that sense of time and perspective. But how you get there is the big challenge. Yeah, it's yeah. not there for yeah. me right now. I don't right. see him there and no. go, uh, no. uh, right. you know. Right. So, and so I can really see how, how yeah. much work you have done. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, yeah. I'm thinking about people that I've worked with who have done mouth to mouth resuscitation or things like that where they just can't, they're in that experience yeah. of having the yeah. person die. You know, right with them, and yeah. you were saying mm -hmm. that the 9/11 families had done well with EMDR, right? The, the firefighters. Yeah. I worked with the families that had lost lost a firefighter, and I also did groups with the firefighters themselves, and they said talking only got them so far, right. but right. it was when they did EMDR yeah. that they really felt yeah. like they were in a better place. Yeah. And so, in in our, fun, in our research, uh, if people were previously well-functioning adults, mm -hmm. and something terrible happens you had about an 80% cure rate, not mm -hmm. like improvement. It, people said, it's gone. Right. It's a terrible mm -hmm. thing that happened, mm -hmm. but it happened a long time ago. Mm -hmm. right. and I said, very, very good results. Um, but the, the big thing, it needs to be safe to remember. And there it becomes very different for adults from kids, because if a kid gets molested uh, by their own parents or their caregivers, it gets much more complicated, mm -hmm. because it has to do with you identity, it has to do something right. with who you are and who you are in relation, in relation to the world. And then it gets to be much more complex and you need to address many other layers. Yeah, of, of so we're talking treatment. about, yeah. you know, an amazing quick rate where we're talking about a highly functioning person or a functioning yeah. person yeah. having a trauma event a yeah. and then moving back, right. you know, mm -hmm. a, a death and, and then moving right. back to functioning again. And, right. and it's not a... It's not, I, I noticed that you said some of the people that um, you worked with had been a couple of years since the death. I know you talked about one woman in your book that had oh been yeah. a couple. So it takes time. I, I always say well, about the first year, you gotta live it. Maybe not, it, maybe not these EMDR things, but yeah. you have to go through every experience after a loss for a yeah. year to kind I've of I also noticed it. something, and yeah. I was wondering what you think about this, Bessel, and it's kind of what you're saying. I've had clients that when I wanted the, you know, when I introduced the idea of yoga or massage or acupuncture during the first year, they were very resistant to doing yeah. anything. They kind of wanted to be where they were in that well, pain know, and story. So it's I a very big issue. The opening chapter of my book, mm -hmm. uh, and my opening, my entry in traumatic stress was that I saw a, a Vietnam veteran who had seen a whole bunch of his friends die. Mm -hmm. He had terrible nightmares, and I gave him a pill to, that pretty much predictably makes night nightmares go away, 
he refused to take his pill. Mm. And I was sort of irritated with him, said, why didn't you take my pill? He said, I need to be a living memorial for my friends who died in Vietnam. Oh, okay. And that was the opening statement that got me into this field mm. and showed me how complex it is because people have the loyalty to the dead and the people who got hurt. And if you go get over it too quickly, you betray your love for those people. Oh, oh that's great. fascinating. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And so what do, you, what do you do to help them? Well, yeah. I wanted to talk about biofeedback a little okay. bit. You take your time. Yeah. Take your no, time. So you take your time, but, okay. but when you really deal with are you ready to let that person go? Mm -hmm. And that, that's, a, that's a big issue, and you don't push that. Right. Because people need to hold on for, for a while. So okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. we're not going to have time to yeah. talk too much about it, but yeah. one of the treatments that you're interested in is yeah. biofeedback, yeah. and I'd suggest that people get right. your book and, it's to, and read about it. A neurofeedback. It's rewiring the brain by playing computer games with your own brain waves. Okay. Wow. Extraordinarily effective for people whose brains have become very distorted by trauma, particularly early childhood trauma, which where you can no longer concentrate, you can no longer pay attention, you cannot engage in things, your mind is all over the place, people misdiagnose you with ADHD or bipolar illness mm -hmm. because you're all over the place because your mind is frantic. Quieting the brain down with neurofeedback can be extraordinarily effective. Yeah. So get, your, get his book and there's some other uh, kinds of treatments. In no, there on too. my website. It's on your website? Yeah. Okay. What is your yeah. website? Yeah. Vesselvendercall.com. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, how do you want to introduce our next guest? Because we're going to be talking to David a little bit about the loss of his yes. mother. And our next guest is Dr. David Fagenbaum. Hey, David. Hi, David. Hey guys, how's it going? Good, so good how are you? you? Good to see you. Yeah, good thanks so you. much. Thank you for Stay having on. me on. Well, David, you've certainly had some loss. I, I <laughs> Load of yeah. baseball. You've certainly had some loss. You lost your mother in college, right? I did, yeah, in my, my sophomore year of college, actually. My mom was diagnosed with brain cancer two weeks before I began my freshman year. Wow. And, and brain cancer is, is really an, an awful illness where you start to lose that person even before mm -hmm. they're truly gone. It starts to affect their personality. And um, it was the most difficult experience of my life to decide, do I go to school or, or mm -hmm. do I stay at home? Mm -hmm. And how did you deal with it? I know you started organizations to help kids now, right? So I, I really struggled in the, the 15 months that I was at Georgetown and, and my mom was home sick, uh, getting chemotherapy and battling cancer. I s really struggled to stay at school. I, I didn't tell any of my friends at school. Only my roommate knew what I was going through. And I traveled home every single weekend for those 15 months. Mm -hmm. And just uh, two weeks before she passed away, I had a conversation with her where I told her, Mom, I'm gonna be okay. And I'm going to start something in your memory for other mm -hmm. kids just mm -hmm. like me. And at the time, I really had no idea what I was talking about, but I knew I had really struggled when I was in college. And my mom loved the idea. She mm -hmm. gave me the biggest smile in the world. And um, so when I got back to school two weeks later, I was on a mission. Oh and what that turned into is Students of AMF, a support network for grieving college students. Wow. And we connect students through uh, peer support on college mm -hmm. campuses and also we get them involved in community service activities to honor these loved ones they've pa that have passed and to get involved in positive outlets. Mm -hmm. In community, great. I'm, I'm sure you do some exercise stuff, fun stuff. We do. Actually, one of our mm -hmm. events that all of our chapters do is called the, the Boot Camp to Beat Cancer or the Boot Camp yeah, to Build like Chapters. It. And so you get out and go through an exercise-based fundraiser in memory of these loved ones that have passed away. Mm -hmm. Wow, and you kind of do a boot camp. Exactly. You go through a tough workout. And just, you said, you know, so many of our of our students, they, they feel guilty having fun at college or they yeah, feel guilty yeah. mm -hmm. um, putting aside their grief. And mm. so um, with AMF, what we do is we actually encourage our students to, to do activities in honor of these loved ones, um, go to fundraising events, uh, uh, do, do in, in memory of these loved ones. Yeah. Now, David, you have got Castleman's disease, right? right? Which is a uh, Neurophysiological. So it's an inflammatory disorder. It's um, it's called lymphoproliferative. So it acts kind of like a lymphoma and kind of like an autoimmune disease. I, I became ill in my third year of medical school, actually, mm -hmm. with multicenter Castleman disease, and it, it's a deadly, life-threatening disease. I actually had my last rites read to me in November of 2010. Um, wow, David. Fortunately, I, I, I survived, as, as you can see. Um, but I got a lot of chemotherapy, ended up getting uh, three rounds of seven-agent chemo cocktails, spent about six months in the hospital, 
Um, but I got out of the hospital after about a six month window to start and it's something I continue to battle with. Mm -hmm. I've relapsed every 15 to 17 months for the last three years mm -hmm. and I'm right now sitting at 15 and a half months. So, yeah. Now uh, David, what are you doing to take care of yourself? <laughs> I was gonna say, does any of this stuff resonate with you? Because this is a trauma. Yeah. Your, your body's having this trauma and it's yeah. traumatic. I mean, does anything help you know what you've heard today. So the way, yeah, uh, absolutely. You know the way that I, I cope with um, with with this illness, and, mm -hmm. and also the way I cope with, with my mom's illness mm -hmm. is to is to, in my mind, take these things on head yeah, on. Yeah. And so um, with with AMF, I started an organization in her memory to mm -hmm. help other students, and that was the most therapeutic thing in the world. Uh, and with Castleman disease, I returned to medical school again on a mission, and it created the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network, which is a global initiative of over 200 physicians around the world and, and over a thousand patients that have joined together to try to take down Castleman David, disease. that's amazing. You're taking it down and you're the quarterback. <laughs> this is right. beautiful and perfect. <laughs> and so, so and you've won some awards I've seen, right? Got some good recognition, yeah. Yes, Recently I was 30 under 30 in Forbes and I just squeaked in by about a month. I just hit my 30th birthday. Okay, wow. David, I'm gonna ask you something. <laughs> Do you feel any guilt about leaving, you know, being more with the Castleman's disease than the other organization? I'm yeah. worried about yeah, you. No, I'm a mom. <laughs> I'm saying, David, so, David, can you get, can you move on? So you know, what, what is with no, the you? The only way that I've been able to do this, so I'm actually no longer board chair for AMF. I sit mm -hmm. on the board and AMF means the world to me, but mm -hmm. I actually have been able to pass the organization on to Ben Chesson, who founded AMF with me. So the two mm -hmm. of us, we were best friends, and actually mm -hmm. when, when my mom passed away, he really struggled struggled with that because he was so close with my mom and wow. it was like losing a mom for him. And so we started AMF together. We've started over 200 chapters around the country. Mm. We have 50 active chapters right now. And about a year and a half ago when I was running full speed after Castleman disease and actually conducted some research that's really changed the way we think about the disease. Mm -hmm. I, I had a long conversation with Ben where um, if there was, if, if it wasn't Ben that would have been the next person to take on the organization, I don't think I ever could have given up the reins, but Ben is just an incredible leader and um, he's my best friend. So mm -hmm. I handed it off to someone what who's doing a great job. What have you said to your mother? <laughs> Sorry? What have you said to your mother? Have you told her? What do you mean, mom? Have you, you written her a note? You know, actually, I, you know, <laughs> yeah. I haven't. I, you know, I talk about my mom every day, yeah. and I think about her every day. Yeah. And so, there's really never a day that goes by where yeah. I feel like I need to reach out. Right. I feel no, like, I'm saying, are you saying, Mom, I've turned it over to Ben? <laughs> I promise, oh, Mom, I'm going to move on to this, yes. Mom. I'm yeah. not going to hang out in this. Yes, I am going to take care of myself, Mom. Yeah, that last one, the take care of myself, is yeah. the important one. And do you do some of these things that we were talking about today? And did you, in order to find hope again after your mom died? Absolutely, exercise. I know Exercise physical is, fitness is absolutely. important to you. So I, I actually um, became a certified personal trainer right oh, around wow. the time my mom got sick. And, and so training myself <laughs> and, and, and training other people was something that I used as, as an outlet. Yeah. Absolutely. Although, Bessel, you got to love this guy, don't you? He's well, give me he's some great. thoughts on him. What do you think? Talk about resilience. Yes, he is. the essence of resilience. I agree. B the biggest thing, and you know, it just happens. You, you yeah. can't say, like, just be there. But your ability to take action, mm -hmm. uh, because you know the natural thing is to just f push it away, forget about it, not confront it, and that's what causes all the damage in kids. Because you're so isolated, and you do want to have fun, and you do want to be accepted by your peers. And if your peers don't accept you in college, your college is going to be a disaster. Yeah. And so it's a real conflict. You cannot be this binary kid who always talks about his mom who's dying or is dead. So, uh, so you're creating an organization where it's possible to have your experience and to talk about it with other kids and still be with other kids like, wow, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, just, that's just fantastic. You know? I, I agree yeah. with you, Russell. I've yeah. known David for several yeah. years now and he is such an optimistic person yeah. and positive and an in, in action person and he's had great adversity and he still is dealing with great yeah. adversity. Yeah. 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 And uh, this issue of uh, internal logos, uh, logos control is what we all try to strive for, uh, mm -hmm. is, to, is to say, Despite the fact that it's terrible things are happening to me, I'm still in charge. You yeah. know, and but you have to remember that you're sort of on the extreme end of the spectrum of a gift that has been given to you. Mm. You know, the, you, I see this as a gift. You know, the, like this is a blessed man who has the capacity to get the illness and become a personal trainer. You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, and to take take it by the horns and to to take care of it. I think that we all should try to do that. But for many other people, it's not so easy to take that degree of control. And they need the inspiration of people like you that it's possible to, to actually 
take charge of your, of your life again. And so you, not only do I admire what you do, but also it's great that other people can mm -hmm. have you as an example to follow in this regard. I really, I really, yeah. Yeah. I really okay. appreciate yeah. that. You know, I mean, what we've really observed with AMF is that mm -hmm. through starting these chapters, so though I say AMF has started over 200 chapters, each one of those chapters is started by a college student who's grieving, who gets mm -hmm. it started in their mm -hmm. in memory of their yeah. loved one, and we get to help them along the way in their, in, their, in their journey to memorialize these loved ones. So it's so cool to be able to see that. And then mm -hmm. with Castleman disease, we're trying to build a culture amongst our community of fighting back, and how can we get other patients yep. and their loved ones to raise money, raise awareness, mm -hmm. and to take this th take this bull by yep. the horns. Because if we wait, no one's going to figure this disease out, and, right. and we can yep. spend a lot of time talking about you know how difficult it is easy to cope with. But we have an opportunity here, and you're See, raising major awareness. Absolutely. See, what's interesting to me is that our culture, and it's interesting you're a doctor because our medical culture is very much like. You're a patient, I'm the doctor, I'm going to fix you. Mm -hmm. And you just passively accept what I tell you to do. Because you have a medical degree and because you have the sort of weird personality you have, <laughs> you say, I'm going to be in charge. <laughs> you know? yeah. And But I'm always pushing is for people to really be in, in charge and involved in their own healing mm -hmm. and not have that doctor-patient, I am mm -hmm. just going to comply with what you do. Uh, because it's very essential to, if you don't want to get traumatized, you need to be an active participant mm -hmm an organizer of your own care. Uh, and you've done that. You're Heal thyself. Great. Like, <laughs> but yeah. you're, in, again, in an easy situation having an MD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, surprisingly, I'm obnoxious. I mean, most, if I were in your shoes, I'd probably become obnoxious. Uh, <laughs> I'm a doctor, you should listen to me. But you seem very gracious about it. <laughs> <He is. laughs> That's very good. I don't know, I don't know how gracious is, <laughs> so but thank you. I appreciate he that. He is. He's so down to earth. That's what yeah. I love about him. Yeah. <laughs> he has a high emotional IQ, oh, yeah. just <laughs> along with everything else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but this, this, this issue of really how can you help people to take charge of their lives mm -hmm. and to negotiate about their care and to not just do what author some authority tells them to do, but to really find out this is what's right for me. Yeah. This is what makes me feel better. And clearly, that's motivated you, and I think. Yeah. Well, well thank amazing. you both for being on the show today. It's been yeah. amazing yeah. having you on. Yeah. Thanks, well, thank Bessel and David. Thanks on. for everything you're doing. Oh, thank you, guys. Uh, and thanks for watching this show today. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley with Dr. Heidi Horsley. Yeah. And we want to say to you always, if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own. And God bless. Mm -hmm.